This is part six in our focus on Ephesians 1, 17 to 19, Paul's prayer that all the glories that he has unfolded for us in verses 3 through 14 would be seen, known, felt, embraced, valued in proportion to their great reality. Watch how he prays. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that's important, glory in all these things and all those things, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Because if you don't have this spirit-shaped spirit of wisdom to discern wisdom and revelation to spot in God's revelation through the Apostle Paul, if you don't have this spirit of wisdom, you will not know God. We, we want to know God. So he's praying, may God give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, in the knowledge of God. Knowing God is all important, and we can't know him if we don't have this answer to Paul's prayer. Or, as he puts it here, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So the effect of this spiritual gift of wisdom and revelation, which every believer needs in order to know God, the effect of it is that our hearts, not just our minds, have their eyes open so that light streams into the heart and we discern value, beauty, worth, greatness, as well as truth. And then three things he wants us to see in particular. The last one we looked at, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and the one we look at now, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And the big question is, is this an inheritance that God receives or that we receive from God? Father, I pray that as we tackle this question, you would give us discernment into Paul's inspired mind, his intention here, and that we might know whether this is your inheritance in us or our inheritance in you? Or is it some combination? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here are the arguments for taking this as something God inherits. Many, many interpreters take it that way. Argument number one, it's called his inheritance, not our inheritance. Argument number two, it's in the saints, not for the saints. Argument number three, in the preceding unit in chapter 1, verse 11, this possession here is us, the church, which he bought with his own blood, according to Acts twenty twenty eight, to care for the church of God, which he obtained, and that's the verb form of possession, in Ephesians 1.14, which he obtained with his own blood. So, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, that's our inheritance, we'll come back to that, unto the redemption of his possession. This is God's possession. So, the argument is, well, if we're treated as God's possession, then it's not a far fetch to say his inheritance is that possession. And argument number four is that speaking of God's inheritance, namely his people, is very common in the Old Testament. For example, Deuteronomy 32, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his heritage. Same word as inheritance. Or Deuteronomy 9.29, for they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Or Jeremiah 10, 16, 
Not like these idols is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. I'm going to come back to this idea where it says, He, God, is the portion of Jacob. That is, he's our inheritance. And his inheritance is Israel. That's very, very intriguing, isn't it? So, those are the four arguments why this inheritance here should be taken to mean God inherits the saints, not we inherit something. Now, let me give you the arguments for taking inheritance here as something we inherit. Argument number one. When you focus on the word his, and then look at how it's used in each of these three prayers, watch, that you may know what is the hope of his calling that he exerts toward the people of God. And the third one, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us? Wouldn't it be natural then to take this his as an inheritance that he gives to his people? That's argument number one. Argument number two, in the saints may simply mean that this glory is indeed going to be an inheritance that happens in the saints. That is, our inheritance will be the working of glorification in us. Argument number three, in verse 14, the preceding use of the word inheritance is indeed our inheritance, not his inheritance. So the immediate context has us inheriting. Argument number four, when you think about the riches of God's glory, it's virtually always used in Paul in reference to something God has which he extends toward us, not something he finds in us. For example, Romans 9, his purpose is to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So, riches of glory for us. Or, Ephesians 3.14, I bow my knees before the Father, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened. So, his riches of glory are the resources for our strengthening. Or, Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory. So his riches in glory extended toward us to meet our needs. Or Colossians 1.27, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We hope in the glory of God because the riches of the glory of God are the mystery of Christ in us. So, the use of the riches of glory here in 118, what are the riches of the glory? Incline us to think he's talking about riches of glory that we will receive as our inheritance, not something that we are, namely God's inheritance. Fourth or last argument, number five, treating an inheritance as something we receive is very common in the New Testament, while treating us as God's inheritance, even though it's very common in the Old Testament, isn't as common in the New Testament. Just a few pointers to that effect. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Or Colossians 3.24, know that from the Lord you will receive 
the inheritance as your reward. Or, if Hebrews 9.15, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Or, 1 Peter 1.3, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So it is very common that inheritance would be used to refer to what God gives us and not as common to say that we are God's inheritance. So which is it? Here we are and we have to decide. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Let me close with this possibility. Let's go back to the section just before this, chapter 1, verses 14 here, and think about this for just one last moment. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. So we are going to receive an inheritance. What is it? That guarantee of that inheritance, that's a guarantee unto the redemption. So that is being freed from anything that hinders our joy, our health, our beauty, our glory, our worship. This is final redemption of God's possession. We saw in Romans 8. 23, that this is especially resurrection from the dead of our bodies. So the completion, this redemption is the completion of the salvation and the beautification and the glorification of God's possession. So they flow together. Our inheritance is that we become glorified, and what is being glorified is God's possession. So the more beautiful and glorious we become by God's saving final power, the more beautiful a possession he has, and all of it to the praise of his glory. So whichever Paul intends here most immediately, and perhaps he knows he's writing it ambiguously when he says this, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. He wants us to think through the fact that if his inheritance is the possession that he bought by the blood of Jesus, and if the redemption of that inheritance is our inheritance, then he gets a greater beautiful inheritance by our inheritance becoming more beautiful and all of it to the praise of his glory. So I'm inclined to think that we should think about these riches as doubly rich because they are going to be riches God creates in us for his own enjoyment, and they are riches that we will experience by being glorified in the likeness of his Son.